I think in general, people feel pretty overwhelmed with the idea of evangelism. I had believed that God could save anyone because he saved me, I got that. But what would change my life and the trajectory of where my life would go is when I realized that God could use me to help save someone. We want to look at how we can all play a part in seeing lives transformed around us. We're going to look at themes like invitation and hospitality and prayer and what it could mean for us to share our lives and our faith with others. We all have a part to play and God is so well pleased to use every single one of us. And as soon as I change the question even, it changes my posture and then everything becomes easier. And there would be an, an in-breaking of love and welcome, and that may be what we're called to do as followers of Jesus in our time. I was just being like faithful. It's like God's call, and that looked like inviting you, and then he like did the rest, and he like obviously like does so much for your life. And then when she asked me to baptize her, I was floored, it was really exciting. It changed my life, it was, uh, like, like, like it changed everything for me. We're in a series called Life Shared at the moment. We're in week two of this series. Um, and we're not going through a particular book of the Bible as a part of this little three-week series, but the themes that we're talking about really capture the heart of Jesus' mission while he was here on earth and the ways that he shared his life in, in authentic and powerful ways with other people. And so what we are talking about is a really, really important part of the mission of Jesus in this world. Um, today, this isn't going to be a deep dive into a, into a passage where we're going to unpack it and try and understand what's happening within the context of, of, uh, of the passage in the Bible. But my prayer is that what we discuss uh, this morning would really resonate with you at, at a heart level. I need my faith stirred regularly. We've spoken about, uh, uh, sorry, sung about witnessing the faithfulness of God. And so it's really a prayer that, um, that we, our faith would be stirred. Um, because this series is designed to help you, to, uh, to encourage you and equip you to share your faith. Now, when I say those three words, share your faith, I know immediately for some of us, there will be a degree of discomfort. It might just be minor. For others, there'll be a lot of discomfort just in hearing those words, share your faith. And last week, we looked at the reality that God's already at work all around us, that He is transforming lives. And as followers of Jesus, that we are all called to join His heart, to join with the heart of Christ and to be His representatives. And the question that we were left with asked, are we open, you and I open, to sharing our lives with the people that we come into contact with in our everyday lives? And when it comes to sharing our lives with other people, Jesus specifically, He calls us to share the Gospel. Um, as a child, I grew up hearing this term, preach the gospel. Many of you would have heard that as well. For me, as a kid, I, I'd have to say that I mostly had negative associations with those three words, preach the gospel. For starters, to preach, you know, is to broadcast a message out loud in front of a group of people. Um, so that word, as a, as a child, was very daunting for me to even think of. And then there's the gospel or euangelion as we looked at last week, which simply means good news. And in, in uh, Matthew 28 in the Great Commission, we see Jesus says to his people, he says, go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And then a few chapters earlier, Jesus says, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. So I think it's pretty clear from Jesus' mission and ministry on earth that he calls us to tell others about the good news of who he is. And as a young boy, I knew um, that this was our mission. I grew up going to church and hearing about this and knowing this is something that we are called to do. And that there's something really powerful about the simplicity of the message of telling someone else about who Jesus is. In fact, as a 12-year-old boy, I remember growing up and I had uh, a couple of friends, they were twins, they lived down the road from us, and I would go to their house to play all the time as a 12-year-old as a boy. Um, and... On this one particular day, I remember, 
and we were playing, and there was one extra boy there, one of their friends, and his name was Chris. And I can't remember exactly how it happened, but somehow the, t- the twins ended up upstairs um, away from us, and we were just downstairs playing in their garage together, and I just had this moment as a 12-year-old where I just felt called, not called, that's not the right word, I just felt to share the gospel with Chris. And so in this moment, I didn't overthink it, I, I just told him about who Jesus was. I said, he's the son of God and he came to earth and he lived and he died and he rose again and uh, we can have forgiveness of our sins and be with him for eternity. Um, simple as that, more or less. And then I asked Chris um, that phrase that often would get used, um, would, would you like to invite Jesus into your heart? And to my surprise, he actually said yes. And so in that little moment, in my friend's garage downstairs, while they were away, I just led Chris in this simple prayer and shared the gospel with him. And and that was that. And then we went back to playing whatever it was that we were doing. It was probably something to do with slingshots or something like that. But as a 12-year-old boy, I just remember the way that I shared the gospel with Chris was really confident. You know, I was was quite clear in my explanation. It was simple in many ways. I didn't hesitate. I didn't pause. I didn't question what I was saying or what I was doing. And for me, as I look back on that, there's actually something really beautiful and inspiring about that. But as an adult, I can say things are very different for me. I can say that I'm sorry uh, to say that there's times that I just haven't had confidence. There are times that I haven't been clear, that I haven't kept the message of, of who Jesus is simple. I've overcomplicated it. And there's absolutely times where I've hesitated or kind of shied away from sharing the good news of who Jesus is. And I can think of many reasons why this is the case. The reality is that we doubt our ability to share the gospel with other people. And I think it's really helpful just for us to take some time right here just to unpack this and name some of the challenges that you and I face when it comes to telling others about Jesus or even just speaking about our own beliefs with other people. And number one is that we all have doubts. When it comes to our ability to talk to others and share Jesus, we have doubts that come through our mind. Things like, I don't know enough about God. I I haven't been to Bible college or completed, you know, theological training. So I'm just not equipped with, you know, I haven't done a diploma in a Christian field. So I can't have these complex, deep discussions with others about my faith and, uh, you know, answer all these questions. Another doubt is I'm not skilled enough. I haven't had any formal training in apologetics or presenting a reason or knowing how to kind of argue in a good way, so I'm not skilled enough to share. Another one is I'm just not ready yet. You know, the timing's not right, God. I've got a lot of other ministries that I'm involved in. I'm, I'm happy serving there, but, but I just can't kind of devote time to this right now. The timing is not right. Another thing is that you and I can get intimidated by the idea of sharing our faith with others. And this is a range of external and internal reasons. I think one of the big factors for how society views, is how society views Christians, when you mention the word Christian, in a negative light. A research by the Barna Group in America looked at what caused people to doubt Christianity. Um, And it says here, I've highlighted the one that I'm zooming in on, there's lots of information on the screen, Um, but they found that 42% of people with no faith doubted Christianity because of the hypocrisy of religious people. So that's almost one in every two people who say there is some sort of disconnect with Christians, people who say they're Christians, and how they live or how they act out their lives. But we're also intimidated for other reasons. You know, the idea of sharing something so personal, so intimate with someone else can almost seem too intense for us at times. In fact, 47% of millennials, that is the generation after Gen X and the generation before Gen Z, 47%, so almost half of them, believe it is wrong to share one's personal beliefs with someone of a different faith in the hope that they will one day share the same faith. They think that's wrong to do that. Another reason that we get intimidated is we say, I just don't know where to start. 
where do I start with sharing my faith with someone else? How do, what do I say to start the conversation? What do I do then if they ask me a question that I don't know how to answer? I, I just don't know. And another thing that causes doubts it, when it comes to sharing our faith is that we can have this inner dialogue of fear. 44% of Christians say that they would avoid discussions about my faith if my non-Christian friend would reject me. So that's almost half of people saying, if there's any sign of rejection, I'm just going to avoid making any sort of conversation about Jesus. Um, and so many of us do have those fears, those inner, that inner dialogue of how will people around me, my friends in particular, how will they perceive me? Will they think I'm judging them when I share my faith or will they think I'm a hypocrite or will they be surprised maybe? Will they even think that I'm crazy? These are the kinds of thoughts that might go through our minds. I don't want to plant these thoughts in our minds but I just want to address and and name some of the challenges um, that happen for us. And I, I think it's worth acknowledging these are very real thoughts that cross our minds. These are very real feelings that you and I can have when it comes to sharing our faith. Um... It's important, I think, at this point just to say we shouldn't allow those feelings or those thoughts or if any of these things that we've spoken about that has resonated with you, we shouldn't allow that to make us feel guilty or feel like, you know, we've blown our chance to share Jesus. Do not let um, it do that. Now, I, like, I know we've looked at some of the negative things. I promise you the message only gets positive from here on out, but I think it's worth addressing some of those challenges that we face. And here's the first positive sign, because when we come, when it comes to sharing the gospel with other people, it's actually more about God than it is about us. You see, we flip the narrative around when it comes to this. We, because it is something so personal, because we are the ones who have to think about delivering that news, because we're the ones who have friendships with other people in our lives, we can tend to put the pressure and the focus on ourselves and make the sharing the good news of Jesus more about what we personally do than what God does and what God says. But really, it's more about God than it is about us. Let's have a look what it says in the book of Acts in chapter 1. If you have your Bible, you can grab that out. It will be on the screen. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 8 this morning is our reading. And this is Luke, who's who's writing to a person named Theopolis, but his message here is, his audience here rather, is much wider than just Theopolis himself. Luke's writing to the church at large. He is speaking particularly to believers, and this is what he has to say, Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through to 8. In my former book, Theopolis, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, He gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Here we see Luke is telling this story of the disciples. They're eating this meal with Jesus, and Jesus says, don't leave Jerusalem, stay here, wait for the Holy Spirit to baptize them. And the disciples then turn a question back to Jesus, and they say, Lord, are you the one who's going to restore the kingdom to Israel? In other words, are you personally going to be the one who's responsible to, for moving and making this all happen by your own hands? But then Jesus uh, says this, these words that are highlighted in verse 8. He says, you will, be my, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Judea and Samaria and to the ends 
of the earth. This is a big verse right here, verse 8. In this one verse, it's, it's almost like the church is empowered and the purpose of the church is revealed to the disciples. You will receive power, Jesus says. That's the power that God freely gives to those who believe in Him. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, the Holy Spirit is the one, Jesus is saying, that He alone is the one who gives this power to believers. He is alive, living, indwelling within us, giving the power to us. And you will be my witnesses. So this is the role of the disciples that Jesus is talking about, to be witnesses of Him, of Jesus. And finally, the task of the disciples is to witness to the very ends of the earth, to take the message to the very corners of the globe. See, it's more about God than it is about us. It's not about what we can say or do on our own or how intellectual we appear to be or how attractive we try to make the message of Jesus out to be to other people. When it comes to sharing the gospel, it's God's power through His Holy Spirit that is at work in us. So church, I think we need to change the dialogue in our minds when it comes to sharing the gospel. Take the focus off ourselves and remove the spotlight from us Give away our ideas and our preconceptions about how God might work in a particular situation. Surrender our thoughts and and our conversations and give up our agenda and recognize that it's Him who's working. That doesn't mean we're not responsible for thinking through things. That doesn't mean we just throw caution to the wind and just go full guns blazing. No, but we need to realize that the dialogue in our minds has or can be easily flipped. And it also doesn't mean that we disappear off into the background because this is the amazing part for you and I, is that Jesus says, you will be my witnesses. The God of the universe invites you and I to join him in his transforming work. Now, if we actually just stop and consider this just for a moment... I think it's pretty amazing because essentially what what God's saying here is I'm peeling back the curtain on what I am doing and I'm inviting you to have a front row seat into what's going on here. God is willing to include you and I in His transforming work and He's willing to use you as you are, where you are right now. He's inviting you to come and be a part of that work. And I know we've heard this message many, many times, but I do believe we can't hear it enough. We need to hear it regularly because I think this is one invitation that we cannot afford to let pass by as the church. This is the very heart of Jesus, that everyone who calls on His name would be saved, that everyone who calls on Him would go from death to life, would go from bondage to freedom would go from hopelessness to a life that is filled with great, meaningful hope. And that's through surrendering and coming to Jesus. This is His heart. And it's because God is the one who gives us what we need and God does the rest. You see, when we focus on what Jesus says about this, when we rely on His power and His authority and not on our own, things look so different. What does God give us? Well, here's just five things that He gives us. Love. He gives us love. Romans 5.5. 5. Our hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. He gives us boldness. Acts 4.29. Peter and John pray this prayer when they are faced with opposition from leaders in Israel. They say, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. And then it says at the end of this passage, they were filled with all the Holy Spirit and and they spoke the word of God boldly. God gives us fearlessness, Romans 8, 15. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. No, rather the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. We are children or we are co-heirs with Christ himself. And that means we don't live in fear. We live in the power and the truth of him. Speaking of power, Ephesians 3, verse 14, Paul prays this prayer to the Ephesians. 
Um, I, for this reason, I kneel before the Father, fr- from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of His glorious riches, He may strengthen you with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you may have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep the love of Christ is and to be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And one final thing to say here is God gives you and I wisdom and He gives us opportunity. Colossians 4 verses 2 to 6, and pray for us too, this is Paul saying this, pray for us that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in change. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards others or outsiders and make the most of every opportunity. God gives us wisdom. He gives us discernment in those opportunities that we have and He gives us those opportunities or those opportunities come along our way as we live our lives. So what were the results for the church um, in Acts who received the Holy Spirit here? Well, they received boldness. Peter, who'd previously been uh, fearful, he'd been denying uh, Jesus, he'd been hiding, running away from uh, anything to do with Jesus. He gets emboldened by the Holy Spirit in in Acts, we see. He preaches the gospel and 3,000 people come to believe in Jesus because of his message. The apostles received love and unity. It says that the believers were united in their faith. They shared all things in common. So they had this love that, that basically looked at after the concerns of others or put the concerns of others before themselves. And that was a great light or a great example of what Christ's love looked like as far as the church was concerned. They also received power from the Holy Spirit. And that allowed them to perform miracles and signs and wonders, and this included healings. We see that Peter and John, they heal a lame beggar at the beautiful gate. Uh, He also heals a paralyzed man. He raises a woman named Tabitha from the dead, and many people in Jerusalem are healed from sickness, and unclean spirits get cast out. Now, all this stuff that's happening at the time would have been absolutely amazing, phenomenal to see. As a first century Christian, th- this, was, this was amazing. The, the Holy Spirit was moving in really powerful and visible ways. For us in 2024 in the West, it can be harder for us to visibly see these signs and wonders like the early church saw. I mean, the fact is, in Australia, we just don't see these kinds of things happening regularly, all of the time. It does happen, but we don't see, uh, you know, big miracles happening regularly, thousands of people coming to know Jesus all of the time. But the reality is, God is the one who is at work. It is His power, it's His promise, it's His presence... It's His goodness in our lives that is working in different ways at different times throughout the many different seasons of our lives that you and I will go through. He's the one at work. My question for you today is, do you believe that? Do you truly believe that God is at work and that He can do what we see as impossible? Do you truly believe that God is all-powerful, that He is able to heal? Do you truly believe that God is inviting you to join Him in what He is doing? For myself, I was recently reminded, sometimes I can just get too comfortable with the way things are when it comes to my belief in the supernatural and the way that God works and the way that God moves. And I'm always inspired when I hear stories about how God has powerfully moved, whether it is healing people from illness or drawing people to Himself, whether overseas or here in Brisbane. And I need that reminder that the same God who powerfully poured out His presence by His Holy Spirit in that upper room filled with the disciples, He's the same God who pours out His presence and His Spirit on me. And He calls me to, to be one who is open to Him moving in power and using me in ways that I don't even expect. God gives us what we need. God does the rest. And God invites you and I to join Him 
in His transforming work. When it comes to the gospel today, there is a really positive trend that we need to consider here. Data from the Barna Group, as of December last year, so that's only four and a bit months ago, say this, that 77% of US adults believe in God or a higher power. 74% of them would, or 74% of people would like to grow spiritually. And 44% of people are more open to God today than they were before the pandemic. 44% of people. These are really encouraging statistics for us to consider. Almost half the population is more open to God today than they were in 2020. That's, that's amazing. That's a great statistic. If we boil these stats down, I think we could see that every second person that you know, that means every second person you know is open to exploring God and faith. Just think about that for just a moment. It means that every three in four people that you know believes that we are more than just our minds and our our physical bodies. They believe in spirituality and they actually want to do something about their own spirituality to grow. And it means that three in four people that you know actually have a belief in, in God or in a higher power, some sort of supreme being. So I want to offer us this thought. The people that you know are more open to meaningful discussions about God and faith than you realise. Now, I know straight away the types of thoughts we can have here. You know, we think about our co-workers, for example. We think about the people that we're involved with in our day-to-day lives and our hobby groups. We think about friends or family that we've known for either all our lives or for a really long time, and we can think, there's just no way that they are open to exploring God or faith. There's just no way. One thing that I've been really convicted of in my own life and that I've been learning myself is just to be aware of coming to conclusions about people. In particular, when we discuss things like faith and life, I've really sensed over time, uh, recently even the Holy Spirit just saying to me, you know, don't write that person off, Dave. Don't come to some sort of conclusion about where they are at. Do not do that. That's not for you to do. And it's been a really powerful reminder for me about God's great love. Because I think about Jesus, think about when he came to earth. He didn't write anyone off, did he? In fact, he spent time with the people in society who were written off. He didn't write anyone off. And so the people that you know are more open to meaningful discussions about God and faith than you realise. I want to invite the worship team to come back now. We have a really great opportunity here coming up in a few weeks' time at Alpha, uh, in a few weeks' time with Alpha at our church. Alpha is all about sparking conversations that explore life, that explore faith, meaning, purpose. And it's been an extremely helpful tool for the church in helping people to discover and to develop a relationship with Jesus. And what I really love about Alpha is that this gets done in a really practical, non-threatening, easygoing, relaxed way. Um, You come together, you share in a meal, get to watch a short video, and then there's a time of discussion where everyone gets to share their own thoughts. Last year, more than 93,000 Australians explored faith through Alpha, and that is almost double the amount as of five years ago. So that's a great, encouraging sign for you and I. Alpha clearly has had a significant impact across our country. And so as a church, we really see value in using Alpha as a tool to help to equip others to explore life, faith and meaning. And that's why we are running Alpha across our church this term and it starts on the 5th of May, just a couple of weeks' time. And we are encouraging everyone who calls our church home to do Alpha in one of two ways. You can do Alpha in your life group. If you aren't a part of a life group right now, we'd love to encourage you to join one, even whether it's just for a short season to do Alpha, or if you've been thinking about getting connected into a smaller community, life groups are a great and important way to to be able to make that happen. So that is one way. The other way is here on Sunday nights, 
as a part of our service at the new time of 5 p.m., 1700 hours for those of you on military time, 5 p.m., um, we are doing Alpha here at church and there's going to be meals and there's going to be tables set up and just a great time just to be able to explore and share and discuss all things to do with life and faith and meaning. Um, If you are listening today and you haven't yet placed your faith in Jesus, you have more questions maybe about who he is, you have more questions about Christianity in general, we would love to invite you to come along to Alpha. Join us on uh, on Sunday night starting the 5th of May at 5pm here and be a part of Alpha. That would be just really great. In closing... Jesus commissions you and I to share the good news of who he is. It's more about God than it is about us. He is the one who gives us what we need. God does the rest. But he absolutely invites us to take responsibility in joining with him as his representatives and sharing the good news of who he is in our lifetimes. And so what I'd love for us just to do as a church Um, just individually where you are seated right now, is just take two minutes right now where you are just to pray and particularly to pray and then then to listen to God and, and ask God these questions. Where in my life, God, are you inviting me to join in your work? So where are you inviting me to join in your work? And who might I invite along to Alpha? Who might I extend that invitation to? Just spend two minutes praying by yourself. Just uh, really just encourage you, ask those questions and then just listen to God. Allow his Holy Spirit to speak. Where in my life, God, are you inviting me to join in your work? Who might I invite to Alpha? And then I'll close to pray. Let's spend some time now.